Our text for the preaching this afternoon is God's Word, as the Church has summarized it in Lord's Day 9. And this is the section that begins the part about God the Father and our creation. In Lord's Day 9, we have the following question and answer. What do you believe when you say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? Answer that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and all that is in them, and who still upholds and governs them by his eternal counsel and providence, is for the sake of Christ his Son, my God and my Father. In him I trust so completely as to have no doubt that he will provide me with all things necessary for body and soul, and will also turn to my good whatever adversity he sends me in this life of sorrow. He is able to do so as Almighty God, and willing also as a faithful Father. Thus far. After the sermon, let us sing from hymn 78, the stanzas 1 through 5. Hymn 78. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is no secret that we live in a science-driven world. In many ways, the push is for newer, faster, and better, and that is what drives our economy. And in therefore, in a sense, most science is futuristic. There is even a branch of, which you know as, science fiction which dreams of faraway places and of technologies that we can only imagine for the moment. Yet the constant pushes on to discover new ways that will make the future our present. In matters of faith, things stand differently. In matters of faith, it is the past that determines the future. More specifically, the work of our Lord Jesus Christ done in the past stands at the center of the faith. And so while science fiction is futuristic, the facts of faith are historic. And this tells us that we must learn from history so as not to repeat the mistakes of former generations. And that brings us to what we confess together in Lord's Day 9 about the first article of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Now, when the Christian church drafted this creed some 17 centuries ago, the world was still very much in the grip of the pagan religions of the Greek and the Roman gods. It was a polytheistic society, that means a society of many gods. And it was a polyethic society morphing into a syncretistic society. That means a society where different beliefs become intertwined to become a new religion, even though these beliefs at first had little or nothing in common. And we see the same happening today, when we hear people say that basically all religions serve the same God. They only differ in their practice, they say. And you see, that is the sad repeat of history that has consequences for how you and I speak about God. Now, it was by the grace of God that 2,000 years ago, the Church of Christ learned to discern the dangers of melting religions with philosophies that have little in common. You see, Christianity confesses one God one Lord, one God and Father of us all. And that is the biblical truth entrusted to the church. And you and I, we must take care that we do not lose sight of that truth. We must take care that we do not let go of the uniqueness of the Christian faith. And we need to guard against the infiltration of foreign ideas, as is happening under the influence of science. For the greatness of God as creator who made heaven and earth in six days, that is generally denied in the scientific model, and this is also infiltrating Christian thinking. 
And that raises a question. It raises the question, should the Heidelberg Catechism be updated to address the claims of science? Is what we confess here still usable? Does science not diminish the relevance and insight of the catechism? Well, I for one firmly believe that the answer to that question is no. For what the catechism has done and what gives it its enduring value is that in dealing with the first article of the Apostles' Creed, Lord's Day 9 addresses the most important issue and that is the question, in whom do you believe? Who do you confess when you say, I believe in God the Father, the Creator? And so I bring you God's word as the church has summarized how our Creator God is our Father in Christ. And two points, this brings a special relationship and this helps us trust in his care. Now, Paul writes in his second letter to Timothy, in chapter 1, verse 12, I know whom I have believed. And with that statement, he directs his faith to Christ Jesus, in whom the truth of God and the true character of God is revealed. In Christ Jesus, the truth about God is summed up for us in one special thought. It is the concept of God as Father. God is not only God, for believers, he is also our Father in Christ. And now in my opening comments, I mentioned that the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the past stands at the center of the faith. And that is because, you see, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who has revealed God to us as Father. And he guides us to God as Father. In Christ, God the Father established a special relationship between him and us. And you see, Lord's Day 9 takes this special relationship as its starting point. The eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is, for the sake of Christ his Son, my God and my Father. And with that statement, my brothers and sisters, we right away make known what we know about our Creator, not as someone who is distant, someone who's aloof and far away, but as God who has a special place for us in his heart and who has a special bond with us. You and I, we may know him, our Creator, as our Father. And the Bible tells us many things about God. Scripture relates how he is the father of Adam, the first created man. And that you know that in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus, as recorded in Luke 3, Adam is listed there as the son of God. The Bible also relates who God is for us, thanks through the Lord Jesus Christ. And through his beloved son, we are God's adopted sons and daughters. And that is why the proper way to speak about God is in light of what Christ has done in the past. The Father's love for us and for his creation is bound up and it culminates in his love for us in his one and only Son who paid for our sins with his precious blood. And so let us, with this in mind, look at the beautiful words of Lord's Day 9 again. We confess that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is for the sake of Christ his Son, my God, and my Father. And now when you sit back and reflect on these words, you suddenly realize that they point each and one of us to a highly privileged position. For based on what we read in the Bible, it is beyond question that God is the creator of the universe and all its creatures, right? All creatures depend on God for their existence and for providing in their needs. But now the unique thing is that of all creatures, 
Only those who are redeemed by Christ's blood can call this God and creator Father. And I want to stress the significance of this truth for a moment. For you see, if we did not have a special relationship with God as our Father in Christ, then what would make you and me, what would make us stand apart from the other creatures? Nothing would. In fact, it would put us on the equal footing with the animals. And the simple reality is that many people who do not believe in God already speak about mankind as a human animal. For you see, on the evolutionary scale, we are just one step up from the apes. But the biblical truth of the matter is that of all creatures, only people can call God their father. And even here, there is a further refinement and restriction. For God is not the father of all mankind. He is only the father of those who know Christ as the eternal son of God. And this is an awesome truth, which we must jealously guard, my brothers and sisters. For you see, there are religious groups that speak of God as father, even though they deny the eternal sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ. But anyone who denies the Lord Jesus as the eternal Son of God, they cannot truly and truthfully call God their Father. You see, God is Father only to those who are adopted as children through the work of the eternal Son and who acknowledge that saving work of Christ. For you see, in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father has shown us the deepest proof of his love towards us. More than his only son, he could not give. And we have the promise of scripture, he who does not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not give us all things with him? And if these words sound familiar, you heard them last week after the Lord's Supper celebration. And how great a privilege it is, therefore, to be able to say, I believe in the almighty creator God, who is my Father in Jesus Christ. And that brings us to the second point. Knowing our creator God as our Father in Christ helps us put our trust in him and in his care. Now, God's mighty act of creating is mentioned in many places in the Bible. Just think about the opening words of the Bible in Genesis. They leave no doubt. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the heavens, which God created long ago, are still stretched over the earth like a tent. Oh, this is a wonderful biblical imagery, for in that sense, Nothing has changed since the day that God created heaven and earth and everything in it. Also, the many Psalms recall God's mighty act of creating. And all of us know that this claim of scripture is disputed. And in a certain sense, this denial is not only strange, it is also very illogical. For we are faced with the odd reality that otherwise brilliant minds consider it reasonable that the universe came into being through the Big Bang. But those same brilliant minds do not consider it reasonable or possible that God simply spoke by his word of power and called the universe into existence. That is odd indeed, because there is no proof to consider the one belief better than the other. And on top of that, the idea of a creator God who upholds and governs his creation is treated as hopelessly outdated. But now we know why people hold that view. They hold that view because they do not understand that God upholds and governs creation for the sake of his son who gave his life for the church. 
Not only do we confess that God created the heavens and the earth, but we also stress that by his eternal counsel and providence, he continues to uphold and govern what he has made. And so we must also treat this part of our faith in light of God's special relationship that I mentioned earlier. The fact that God provides us in our needs is because he keeps his word of promise that he gave to Noah. After the flood, God set the rainbow in the sky and he gave the promise never again to curse the ground or destroy every living creature because of the sins of mankind. God promised that while the earth remains, the seasons for growth and rest will remain. And God has remained faithful to that promise. Our creator still upholds and governs all things. And all you have to do is look around it and you'll see it. Soon the remaining crops come off the fields. Our creator God upholds the seasons. And this is then an indicator of another important reality. You see, if we firmly believe the Father's ongoing care for his creation, then we can also live in the confidence that God will provide in our needs. Isn't that true? You see, there is no reason to doubt that he will provide us with all things necessary of body and soul, and that he will turn to our good whatever adversity he sends to us in this life of sorrow. And then we profess that he is able to do so as almighty God and willing also as a faithful father. Now, this is a wonderful expression of faith, my brothers and sisters. But now the point is, it must be more than a wonderful expression of faith. For you see, nice expressions can so easily become inactive theory. And therefore, it must also be something that you and I not only say, but also believe and embrace with conviction. For if these words are no more than a nice sounding theory, then we would only be fooling ourselves in believing that the Father cares for us. You see, theory is always something that is substantiated in practice. But scripture reveals God as almighty God who has our best interest at heart and who has your and my life in his hands. As almighty God, he has the whole world in his hands. And so we say God is almighty. But what does that mean? Does it mean that God can do literally anything? No, that's not the meaning. For did you know that there are many things that God cannot do? Or that may sound strange to you because we read in Scripture that nothing is impossible with God. For instance, in Luke 3, verse 16. But you see, we always need to read that claim in its context. When the angel told Mary that nothing was impossible with the Lord then the context tells us that it has to do with Elizabeth, who is beyond the age of having children, but she has become pregnant. And the context tells us that nothing is impossible with God when it comes to saving us. But there are things that God cannot do. For example, God cannot act out of character. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2, verse 13, If we are faithless, he will remain faithful. And here it comes. For he cannot disown himself. And now the positive way of saying this is that even though there are things our holy God cannot do, he does everything and all things he intends to do. As we sang from Psalm 135, the Lord does whatever pleases him. And in that way, God is almighty. And that is the basis on which we boldly confess 
that God provides us with all things necessary for body and soul or turn adversity to our good. For with this declaration, we voice our steadfast confidence that God can be trusted, that we can take him at his word. We don't have to doubt his capabilities for one moment, nor do we have to doubt his willingness to care for us. For you see, to trust God as not to doubt requires that we dare to give all things out of our hands into his hands. Now, I'm sure that everyone here knows that trust and doubt are opposites. If we trust God, we don't doubt him. If we doubt God's ability to care and provide, then we lack trust in him. And therefore, please do not minimize the impact of what you and I confess in Lord's Day 9. For if the I believe in God the Father Almighty, if that statement is the equivalent to saying, I trust in God who is never at a loss to help out, well, then we should entrust ourselves to him so completely as to have no doubt that he will provide us with all things necessary for body and soul. In other words, we must be prepared to place our life with all its cares and all its hopes and all its ambitions into his hands. So we need to dare to believe in his care, but we also need to dare to entrust into his care. For in God's caring hands, we are safe. He daily provides everything we need for body and soul. But notice that the Catechism adds in the same breath that my God and Father in Christ, his Son, will also turn to my good whatever adversity he sends me in this life of sorrow. You see, the Catechism, the more you read it, the more you study it, you see, it's such a realistic book. It's not a pie-in-the-sky religion or confession. No, the catechism time and again gives us a sober assessment of life. There is no such thing as a health and wealth faith. Even though God has promised to give us all that we need in life, he has nowhere promised that we would not meet adversity in life. And we do not serve a health and wealth God, but reality paints a totally different picture. Life often brings major upheavals. We even confess that it is God himself who sends adversity our way in this life of sorrow. Would COVID-19 fit in that category? I think it does. And it is on that point that people often stumble and claim that they cannot believe in God. The argument is, why would God, a God of love, send sadness into our lives? If he is able to do all things, why doesn't he take away illness and hurts? But since he doesn't, it either means that he can't do it, or that he's uncaring, or it is proof that he simply does not exist. But the question is, does the existence of hurt and loneliness, illness, and whatever else you may encounter in life, do these things prove that God, the Father, is not almighty or caring at all? No, this does not prove that at all. It doesn't prove that the Father is not almighty or caring. It does prove, however, that we should not think of God as being the genie who fulfills our every wish. But he is the God who wants us to rely on him in prosperity and adversity. And then the end result of our faith and reliance on him is that he is removing the evils and the burdens from our lives. For you see, through the Lord Jesus Christ, 
sinners like you and I are already being renewed to that new life. A new pain and disease-free bodies are on the way, and a new heaven and a new earth will be made ready for them. And now, if God moves more slowly than we wish in clearing evil out of the world and introducing the new order, it is not because it proved harder for him than he originally thought. Now we find the correct answer in 2 Peter 3, where we read in verse 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, Peter comments. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And that is why we confess the certainty that in everything God works for good with those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And therefore, no one here, my brothers and sisters, no one here needs to doubt God's power in the world and in your life. God works all things for good with those who love him. And he does so because as almighty God, he is able to do it. But he does so according to his own timetable. As God's children, we sing, praise the Lord who over all things is wondrously reigning, sheltering you under his wings, oh so gently sustaining. Have you not seen? All that is needful has been sent by his gracious ordaining. And so you and I can keep on saying with Paul, I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. You see, as Christians, we have a reason to boast in Christ, and we have a reason to boast in confidence, for faith is always boasting in the Lord. And that is not just good news, it's the best news ever. Amen.